So, uh, happy to talk to you about Oppenheimer. How many people have seen the movie? Okay. A lot. I'm, I'm impressed. How many people, maybe I should do it the other way. How many people have not seen the movie? Just, Ooh. just a hand. Okay. All right. Did you like the, you've seen the movie? Did you like it? Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. I think it's great. I, uh, besides being a physicist, I'm a, I am a history buff. I'm actually, this year, this is my final year. I'm the chair of the American Physical Society's Historic Sites Committee. And so within the American Physical Society, which is the professional society for physicists in the U.S., although he can also be a foreign member, um, we each year select one or two uh, historic sites uh, that are important in the history of physics, um, some of which are actually involved in what we'll be discussing today. So uh, we'll have the Manhattan Project. Can I ask so, a question? Yeah. How many of you have been to the Trinity site? The Trinity site. Anybody been to Trinity? Oh, nobody. Yeah, I have. So uh, I have. I'm going to show you some pictures. I'll show you, some, and I'll tell you when you can visit. Um, you just missed it, by the way. Um, so, so I have an interest in history. But I'm also a big film nerd. I, I, I'm a movie buff. TCM was was created for me. I, I love movies. So, uh, uh, I want to talk about all three of those things. I want to talk a little bit about the science, uh, a, a lot about the history. So you don't have to be a physicist to follow the talk. We're going to talk a lot about the history. Talk a little bit about the movie as well, uh, what I liked, what I didn't like, things like that. I want to hear your feedback as well. So, um, And I'm going to start off by not talking about any of those things. And so um, I want to talk about uh, which button do I push? Not that one. This one. I want to talk about two old men. Um, the, the one on the left uh, is H.L. Sawyer. He just celebrated a birthday. He would have been 107, um, born in 1916, died back in 2007. Then my dad, if, if you couldn't guess, right? Uh, and so I, and my laptop is dead. I had some great pictures I was going to include of him older. He lived to be right, right at 91. Uh, October 16th, Monday was his birthday. But uh, he was in the he was in the Navy in World War II. He was a boatswain's mate on uh, several ships. But at the end, at the time we're talking about. Uh, he was on what was uh, the USS Wren. So at the time of the Trinity test, they had just taken part in the Battle of Okinawa, which is sort of the first island uh, from the south that is considered part of Japan proper, right? So it's not considered one of the home islands, but that really was the beginning of the invasion of Japan there at the end of World War II. And so he was primed to go in when the Japanese, I mean, I'll skip to the end, when the Surrender was signed on the uh, USS Missouri, uh, and the Japanese surrendered to Douglas MacArthur in Tokyo Bay. Uh, my dad's ship was, he wasn't on the Missouri, he was, they were one of the ship, part of the fleet uh, that was in Tokyo Bay. He was parked about two ships behind the Missouri, so he was there for the Japanese surrender. And I heard stories, of course, about World War II and, and the Pacific all my life growing up. You know, he, there, there's two kind of veterans. I don't know. Uh, People know that there's veterans who don't say anything. My, my wife's dad was in Vietnam. He does not talk about it at all. And veterans like my dad who couldn't not talk about it. Just you know, you know, any you know, tell me about seeing the volcano in in the South Pacific as you were taking weapons to Australia at the beginning of the war. Oh yeah, you know. So the other old guy I want to talk about is this fellow, Ward Siegendaller. If you're a member of SPS. Or you're a member of our Honor Society, Sigma Pi Sigma. Uh, Sigma Dollar was president of uh, Sigma Pi Sigma for many years. Uh, he contributed a lot to both of those organizations. Uh, he was an old Kansas boy and uh, spent many years at North Carolina State University. He was department head there for a while. He was a nuclear physicist. But uh, in 2004, Sigma Pi Sigma had a Congress uh, in New Mexico, a, a, a quadrennial meeting, four years meeting. And uh, we all went to the Trinity site with uh, with Ward Siegendaller. This is him there in 2024. He passed away in 2013, uh, again, up in, up in his 90s. And he was part of what's called the Plutonium Criticality Team. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. Dr. Fadalow will talk about it more in two weeks when she does her seminar about criticality tests. It's really interesting. It was really deadly, uh, it turns out. Uh, but i am leave that as a, kind of a... A little, uh, you know, uh, what well, kind of a teaser, teaser, teaser a little yeah. teaser there. Yeah. 
But uh, when they when the Trinity test occurred, he was uh, Ward Siegenthaler was nine miles away. He was in a pickup truck parked up on a ridge, um, and he told us all about that. It was amazing to hear that firsthand account. Um, but here's what here's why you came. The, the movie was released this this uh, summer. It was terrific. I saw it over in Geneva um, with French subtitles and English with French subtitles. That was interesting. Um, they, here's the trailer. For those of you who haven't seen it, I'm, I got both of the trailers. I'm, we're going to play both of them because there's some scenes in here where I want to refer to. And so if you haven't seen the movie, out of fairness, at least you'll kind of maybe see uh, part of it now. So... Um, we're going to come back to several things that are in there, including who the act those actors are supposed to be portraying. Um, but uh, um, if you just watch the trailers, what do you think the movie's about? <laughs> the monk, right? I mean, that's all that show. There's a lot in the movie about Oppenheimer's affairs. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then a lot of it, particularly the stuff that's in black and white, is about what occurs immediately after World War II with Oppenheimer losing his security clearance, um, essentially a, a kind of a backroom um, plot to, to, to get Oppenheimer out of his uh, position of influence of the government. Uh, this is during what was called the Red Scare or the McCarthy era, um, when uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, people who were either were communists or had been affiliated with the Communist Party in the 1930s having uh, any sort of position of influence in American life. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right. Who is the guy? J. Robert Oppenheimer. J. Robert Oppenheimer, an American. He's from, uh, was born in New York, um, grew up on the Upper West Side. If you ever been to the Upper West Side, it's a very nice part of New York. Uh, it's uh, very expensive. It was where John Lennon lived. Uh, I remember who he was. Um, his father arrived in the country penniless. Uh, in 1888, and uh, uh, was a successful textile importer and, and got rich. His mother uh, was an older Jewish family. Uh, this is a really good book, American Prometheus. Uh, uh, I've read, not all of it, but I've read parts of it. Oppenheimer represented a kind of a, a fusion of two different groups of Jewish Americans. There was a, an older, mostly German a uh, group of Jewish Americans who had been in the U.S. a longer time, and then there were sort of the newer Jewish Americans coming from what is now Russia and Poland and the Ukraine uh, and uh, arriving in the 1890s and, and later. And, and there was there was friction between the two, but he was really very much part of, of that older group. Uh, his mother was kind of from that older group of German, German Jewish American uh, they were very well off. Um, he uh, attended private schools. Uh, one of the private schools was run by a very famous psychologist and philosopher named Felix Adler. Some of you may have heard of. Um, they had art. They had Picassos and Van Goghs in, in their apartment on the Upper West Side of, uh, of New York. They, uh, and, and that's going to come back in a moment here. Oppenheimer was, was a precocious child. He's one of those gifted children. I think a lot of us in this room probably had that tagged on us for better or worse when we were young. Um, so a lot of it was expected of him. He was interested in a broad range of uh, subjects. He was very much interested in mysticism. Uh, he was a big fan of, of Hindu religion. Uh, he thought there was more to offer in the Bhagavad Gita or uh, the Mahabharata than uh, in some of the common religious texts of the West. Um, he had a nervous uh, disposition. He probably had a, probably now we would say he had ADHD. Uh, really couldn't concentrate on one thing for very long. He was he would flip from one subject to another, but he would learn a language in a few months. He uh, uh, we're going to show I'm going to show you a picture of him in the Netherlands working at, at uh, a lab in life, and he gave a talk in Dutch. He he didn't know Dutch. He he learned Dutch to give the talk. So I mean, he was that kind of person. Um, he was given to depression at several depressive episodes of life. He entered uh, Harvard uh, in 1920. He was a chemistry major originally. Yeah, chemistry kid. Uh, and uh, uh, he switched to uh, physics. Harvard doesn't give BSs. They give APs. And it's a Bachelor of Arts, but it's artist Bachelor of Arts or whatever they call it at Harvard. Uh, but he completed that in like three years. He was a smart, he was a smart guy. Uh, always thin, always pencil thin. 
always smoking. He was a chain smoker all his life. Again, y'all probably don't remember this. I remember this. Everybody smoked. You know, even when I was a kid, everybody smoked, right? When I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. But uh, uh, he was a chain smoker all his life. He, he died relatively young. He was 62 uh, when he died. And that's looking younger and younger to me all the time. Um, after he graduated from Harvard, he went to Cambridge initially to study. He wanted to work with Rutherford. Rutherford didn't want him. Uh, Rutherford, discoverer of the nucleus, right? Ernest Rutherford. Um, he was a lousy experimentalist. Einstein was a lousy experimentalist. Dirac was too. They they didn't do well in the lab. Oppenheimer broke things. Um, there there are a lot of theorists like that. It was it was uh, was it Beta that the the Beta or uh, one of them? Whenever you go in the lab, something would always break. Right. The, the, anyway. Um, there's a scene in the movie where he poisons his supervisor at, at, at Cambridge, uh, the apple he was going to eat. Uh, this guy by the name of, of uh, Blackett, who later won the Nobel Prize in part for particle physics. That is actually true. In that scene, they have Bohr visiting at the time, and Bohr wasn't visiting at the time. Um, and uh, Oppenheimer did... <coughs> regret what he was doing. He was kind of, again, kind of suffering from depression at the time, admitted what he had done, and his family had to kind of bail him out, you know, like send large money, large amounts of money to Cambridge to, to get him from not being kicked out or arrested or something like that. Uh, but essentially, you know, it was mutually decided that maybe he ought to go to Germany and study. And so he went to Göttingen. Again, something that maybe not everybody realizes um, American science circa 1910, 1920 sucked. <laughs> we were a backwater. We were a backwater. We, we were famous for invention, for entrepreneurship. We were the land of Edison. You know, we were the land of Henry Ford. Uh, even the cars were first built in Europe. Uh, you know, Ford, you know, mass produced. Um, you know, Rockefeller. You know, we, we, we had that reputation. But basic science, you went to Europe to study. Uh, the guy who created the chemistry department at LSU studied under the Curies, right? That's that's what you did. Uh, there were only a handful of like truly world-renowned American scientists pre-World War II, well, and certainly pre-1920s, right? Gibbs at Yale and you know a couple others, Michelson. Um, but but the center of science was Europe, and the center of science was really Germany. Germany had the great scientists. Um, so he goes, he goes to Europe, he goes to Gerdingen, Mark is going to get mad at me when I, he, whenever I, great, what he said, um, he studied under the great Max Born, which I'll tell you some trivia about Max Born in a moment, but, uh, Max Born is one of the creators of quantum mechanics, and, uh, uh, while he was there, he met Heisenberg, very important figure in what we're talking about, Pascal Jordan, uh, uh, he met Teller, Teller comes back a lot in this discussion. Fermi, Enrico Fermi, Paul Dirac, met Maria Gobert. Maria Gobert actually complained about Oppenheimer in the lectures, wrote this letter of complaint because he talked all the time. Wouldn't shut up. So she, and nobody else could say anything. So um, this is a picture of him. Again, this is at uh, a lab in uh, Leiden, which is in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, it's uh, This guy is the guy who discovered superconductors. Uh, he's not in this picture. His Kramer, uh, his uh, suit is. But there's Paul Dirac, if, you, if, you, if you've ever heard of him, uh, and standing right next to him. That's Oppenheimer, circa, circa 1927. This is Paul Ehrenfest over here. Paul Ehrenfest and his wife, uh, Tatiana. Tatiana Ehrenfest was a, a mathematician. Paul Ehrenfest was a, a, a one of the great elucidators of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Killed himself, uh, committed suicide. Uh, the following year, I think, I think this is like a year before Aaron first uh, shot, shot himself uh, and uh, and their son who uh, had Down syndrome. Uh, and uh, But uh, uh, if you watch the movie, he uh, meets uh, Robbie, I, I, Robbie, on, on a train while he's traveling in Europe. I cannot find any evidence that, that actually happened. Um, I think that's one of these things that for storytelling purposes, uh, no one puts in, but uh, he met a lot of these other people while he was over in Europe. Um, when he gets back from Europe, 1928, uh, 
He initially takes a position at Caltech. Uh, he was working with Linus Pauling, again, chemistry, yay, yay chemistry, working with Linus Pauling, uh, doing the early quantum mechanics to explain molecular bonds, and then he ran off to Mexico with Pauling's wife. And for some reason, that just ruined his relationship with Linus, Linus Pauling. They didn't work together anymore. Um, so, uh, but he was also being recruited by Berkeley, uh, University of California, right, Cal? Uh, and so he, he First, it's kind of like a little joint form, but then he moves to Berkeley. At Berkeley, there's this fellow named E.O. Lawrence. Uh, that's Lawrence here. E.O. Lawrence. And E.O. Lawrence is building a device to accelerate charged particles, really accelerate uh, protons, accelerate nuclei. He's building the first particle accelerators, and it was called a cyclotron. This is 10 years later. This is 1938. This is the large 60-inch cyclotron uh, that Lawrence built. Uh, and here is Oppenheimer smoking again, as always, smoking up here uh, at the top. And uh, that's Macmillan, I believe. And uh, again, Lawrence down here. So Lawrence and Macmillan sort of build the cyclotron. Uh, if you want to say a cyclotron, uh, go to Willis Knighton over in the Shreveport. They're used in hospitals now for what's called proton therapy. And in fact, very soon after Lawrence built his first cyclotron, his father, his father, his brother was a physician. And they almost immediately said, can we treat cancer or other diseases uh, with this device? And so medical physics kind of be begins at the same time as uh, sort of nuclear physics with the cyclotrons here. But uh, uh, Oppenheimer was essentially part of the team from the theory standpoint, interpreting the results that came out of the cyclotron, out of the collisions uh, that they were able to pr produce at, at what were then very, very high energies. Of course, we consider it low energies now. This, this is shown in the movie. He's shown visiting Lawrence. The cyclotron they show in the movie is too big. Uh, you know, if it's if it's right when Lawrence is first building his cyclotrons, it was a small, almost tabletop device, and they show a big device like this. But again, that's that's okay, you know, for storytelling purposes. Um, okay, so that's what kind of happens before World War II. Let me tell you what happens after World War II. Because it in, it's the in-between that we really want to talk about. So after World War II, he became the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies. That's the Institute for Advanced Studies. It's a big think tank. It's this big private estate. It's sort of peripherally associated with Princeton University. The first couple of years, it was considered part of, part of Princeton, and then it was sort of became independent. Uh, but it's there in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, it's a place where people are invited to come and live and think. That's it. You don't have any teaching duties. It's it's a bunch of theorists, mathematicians, philosophers, other acad uh, academicians, biologists now. Uh, and, and you're invited to come there and, and you live there and uh, stroll around the grounds. And hopefully you come up with some great ideas. That's the whole idea. This is Einstein. This is a real, this is not the same from the movie. This is the real Einstein and the real Kurt Gerdel. And uh, Gödel it was a mathematician, came up with what's called the incompleteness theorem, proved that any self-consistent uh, system like logic or arithmetic has to have questions in it that cannot be answered yes or no, true or false. They're unanswerable within the system itself. It's called the incompleteness theorem. Uh, Gödel is also one of these really sad stories. He was sort of, you know, we would say on the spectrum now. And toward the end of his life, so he, he, he had had a friend who was killed, assassinated by the Nazis. And so, you know, all these people came from Germany, Austria, places like that. Kurt Gerdel came from Austria. Uh, Einstein was at Berlin before he came to the U.S. Um, he had a friend who was poisoned by the Nazis. The rest of his life, he had a fear of being poisoned. It was, just, it was an obsession of his. He would only eat food that his wife cooked. In the 70s, his wife got sick. She was hospitalized. She eventually died. Gerdel just stopped eating. He didn't eat anymore. And, and he starved himself to death. Literally starved himself to death. There is a scene in the movie where Oppenheimer is visiting Einstein, I think it's the second time, to talk to Einstein about this, these calculations that showed that maybe the atmosphere might ignite from the atomic bomb. That scene didn't happen. I'll talk about that a moment later. But briefly, it shows Einstein walking with 
Kurt Gerdel, and he introduced the uh, Kurt Gerdel talk. Anyway, Institute for Advanced Studies. Louis Strauss, again, one of the main characters in the movie. I'll show you him in just a moment. Was on the uh, board of trustees of the Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, and he did, in fact, offer Oppenheimer the position as director there. So Oppenheimer became director in about 1950 and was director up until a year before he died, after he'd already been diagnosed with cancer. 1966, he retired. 67, he died. Uh, the institute itself was established in 1934 by a bunch of the land, the land purpose, I can almost say that word. Um, it was meant as a refuge, again, for these, these theorists and mathematicians to you know, be kind of away from the obligations of ordinary life. But it really became a refuge for Jewish scientists and mathematicians in the 1930s. People like Einstein fleeing the Nazis and, and the fascists in Italy and, and elsewhere. Um, it was remarkably open. Uh, they offered a position to an African-American scientist uh, at the time when it was still associated with Princeton. And Princeton, New Jersey, right? Up north there, everything's perfect, right? Looking at Steve. <laughs> Princeton was notoriously racist. Princeton was called the, the northernmost city of the Confederacy. It was it was that bad in the 1930s. They did not allow blacks uh, to be students. And so one of the reasons, in fact, the IAS spun off and became independent so they wouldn't have those sort of restrictions on them anymore. Um, but uh, uh, they... They were very open, very diverse for the time period. Um, so he was director for years and years and years after World War II. In 1963, he, had, he received what was called the Enrico Fermi Award from the Atomic Energy Commission. This was the civilian organization that was set up after World War II to control nuclear materials. In the 1970s, it became the Department of Energy, or was absorbed into the new Department of Energy. Uh, JFK was a big admirer of Oppenheimer, and, but... Uh, he was assassinated just before Oppenheimer received the award. So JFK was assassinated in November of 63. Oppenheimer receives the award in December of 63. Uh, so Johnson uh, Johnson gives him the award. Why, why did this go away? At least I just need to touch it. Touch it. There we go. I touched it. Um, the presentation was actually boycotted by Republican members of uh, the Science Committee, uh, who still harbored grudges against Oppenheimer over his alleged communist contacts, or real communist contacts. So he was still a controversial figure that late. He died from throat cancer in uh, in 67. So, so again, at age of 62. So what happened in between? So that's Oppenheimer before the war, and we're going to come back to the science a little bit later. After the war, he did this. What happens in between? Well, in 1939, there was a letter sent. Einstein did not write this letter, but he signed it. It was written by Leo Zillard, a Hungarian-born scientist who had come to the U.S., a nuclear physicist, and Eugene Wigner, one of the great names uh, in science. In fact, somebody I actually got a chance to, to meet late in his life at CERN uh, in the late 80s. Uh, they drafted this letter essentially to warn Roosevelt that A, uh, there were scientists in Germany who were probably working on nuclear power, atomic power, as it was called, uh, that it was a possibility to use these chain reactions to construct a bomb. It's conceivable, no less, no less certain. Uh, extremely powerful bombs of new type may be constructed, urging him to, to uh, find some way of securing uh, the uranium uh, deposits in Canada, uh, Czechoslovakia, which was under Nazi control at the time, Belgian Congo, which was not completely, under, well, essentially under German control, right? It was very far away from Germany, but Germany had overrun uh, uh, Belgium at that point. Um, really didn't really didn't say let's start a Manhattan Project, but just really warning, warning uh, President Roosevelt of these possibilities. And Roosevelt created a commission to look into this. Could Should should we be doing something about this? And it was, uh, I went the wrong direction, sorry. Uh, and it was decided to, in fact, explore the possibility of creating one of these bombs ourselves, particularly before the Nazis could, before the, uh, Germany could. And so, uh, 39, October of 39, Roosevelt gets the Einstein letter. Uh, later that 
fall, uh, increase an advisory committee on uranium. Uh, the British were also looking at this, uh, 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 what was called the MAUD, M-A-U-D group. Um, 1940s, uh, they start uh, funding the building of a, of a graphite, what's called pile, nuclear pile, a nuclear reactor uh, for a control chain reaction. So one interesting thing in the Manhattan Project is control nuclear power actually comes first before the bomb. They usually maybe the other way around. Um, so all of this is before the U.S. enters World War II. The U.S. is attacked uh, December 7th uh, uh, at, at Pearl Harbor. But remember, World War II had started in Europe in September 1st, 1939. And actually, it started a little earlier in the Far East when the Japanese uh, uh, attacked China. Uh, but uh, we entered World War II in December. Uh, of, of, uh, and then the following September, Leslie Grove is chosen to be the head of the Manhattan Project. It was General Groves who was the head of Manhattan Project, not Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was only the director of the Los Alamos lab, but he was he was chosen there uh, about a month later. Uh, he was very familiar with New Mexico. Um, he had a problem because of smoking. He had suffered from tuberculosis in the 30s, had gone to New Mexico for the dry weather and uh, had fallen in love with it, which I'm also in love with New Mexico. I love, I love that, that state. And uh, and he knew about a place that was very remote near Santa Fe, but but uh, remote that would be a perfect site for creating a secret lab, and convinced Doug Rose to to build uh, something there. And they April fifteenth, nineteen forty three, Los Alamos was open. So April nineteen forty three, July sixteenth, nineteen forty five, they explode a bomb. That is a crash. Project. I, I mean, uh, two years essentially, uh, in which the, all of this this happens. It's amazing. The Manhattan Project actually did include Manhattan. It's not showed here, but it actually did have an office in Manhattan. Um, but it was mostly a code name. Um, there was work done at Columbia University, uh, but Rochester, uh, up in uh, Steve's kind of neck of the woods, uh, Chalk River up in Canada, and also over here uh, the, the Trail Lab in uh, British Columbia. Uh, Hanford, it was one of the main sites. So the big sites were Hanford and Oak Ridge, where they did isotope separation. So this is trying to try to get enough of the fissile material, the material that will create fission chain reactions. Uh, Chicago, where Fermi was working, uh, is uh, where they were trying to build a controlled chain reaction and succeeded. Uh, that was called a metallurgical laboratory. Ames, Iowa. Louisiana Tech had, had a graduate by the name of David, David Templeton. He was our first chemistry distinguished alumnus. And he worked with Glenn Seaborg in Ames uh, on the Manhattan Project. And then when Seaborg went to Berkeley, uh, the radiation lab there that, that Lawrence had started, uh, Templeton followed him, worked, worked with Glenn Seaborg during the Manhattan Project, later got his PhD from Berkeley, stayed on as a faculty member and became uh, eventually chair of their, they have a chemistry and chemical engineering department. Very important person, a Louisiana Tech graduate, worked on the Manhattan Project. Uh, so we had Lawrence's radiation lab there, uh, but then the main site for the, putting everything together and constructing the bomb was here at Los Alamos in northern New Mexico. And then the test site, and I'm, and I'm going to show you a better map in, in a while, uh, occurs down here at Alamogordo uh, in southern New Mexico, near uh, an Army, uh, uh, we didn't have an Air Force then, an Army Air Corps testing grounds. So these are some of the sites, of course, Washington, D.C., right? Uh, but uh, some of the sites, but again, the main one, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Hanford up here in Washington, Berkeley, and then uh, uh, Chicago names and, and Los Alamos. Uh, this is General Leslie Groves. Uh, he had built the Pentagon. All right, so Pentagon, the largest building by volume in, in the world. Uh, he had built that uh, just prior to World War II. Um, he was selected to be overall head of uh, the Manhattan Project. Again, Robert Oppenheimer uh, was assigned to director of what they call Project Y. Project Y was Los Alamos. This is Vannevar Bush, and he's shown in the movie. I'll, I'll show you the actors here in just a moment. Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush is one of those Bushes. <clears throat> Who am I talking about? So, 
H. W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush. Is that Prescott Bush, George H. W. Bush's father? Uh, it's that family. New England, kind of rich, old money, sort of. And that that was his background. He had what was called the Office of Scientific Research and Development, and I think of him as a kind of a hero of science. Vannevar Bush, after World War II, creates the idea of the National Science Foundation. Let's let's keep this scientific work that we started during the war, let's keep it going in peacetime. He pushed for the creation of civilian labs on the same model as uh, the Manhattan Project, uh, along with Robbie, who I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, he also came up with the idea of hypertext. Just that not not on a, he didn't have a computer that could do it, but he imagined that idea of like a universal dictionary where he, he select a word, it would go off and it would bring up new information for you in a, in a paper he wrote in the 1950s. Very smart guy, electrical engineer. Uh, James Conant, so this is Vannevar Bush again, this is Harry Truman, president uh, toward the end of World War II, and this is James Conant, he headed up what was called the National Defense Research Committee. Um, Fermi, who creates the first successful chain reaction at the University of Chicago, uh, Pile One, uh, this is him with uh, uh, some of his team there in Chicago, including Leo Zillard. There's Zillard there. Um, AP, my committee on APS this year selected the site of Pile 1, uh, which is not the pilot stack field, uh, but it's a, uh, it's been torn down. There's nothing there but a marker now, but it's a, a, a park now outside of uh, Chicago. But that we selected that this year as one of our historic sites. In association with Stag Field, which was Stag Field was a, a a stadium at the University of Chicago. All right, I gotta go faster, don't I? This is Hans Beta. He was the head of the theory division at Los Alamos Glen Seaboard, who I mentioned. Discovered everything, discovered plutonium, discovered that plutonium was more fissile than uranium off of Compton, uh, directed the Chicago Metallurgical Labs. Okay. Uh Edward Teller. Edward Teller is a lot in the movie. He wanted to go, he didn't want to build an atomic bomb, he wanted to go straight to a hydrogen bomb. He's considered the father of the hydrogen bomb, along with a guy by the name of Ulam. I. I. Rabi is in the movie a lot. Uh, he was actually the guy who discovered NMR. He wasn't a nuclear physicist, but he was very much into uh, scientific policy by this time and, and policy making. He worked with Vannevar Bush. He had the idea also of having civilian labs on the model of Los Alamos. He brought that idea back to Europe, where he had been born, and convinced some scientists to push for that within UNESCO, and that was the creation of CERN, where I work and where Marcus works on the Atlas experiment. Uh, Robbie is really the father of CERN. Uh, Louis Strauss was a self-made millionaire. He was always interested in science, uh, but his family was, was too poor to send him to school. That's that, that later group of Jewish immigrants I was talking about to the U.S., uh, he was from the South, and he pronounced the name Strauss instead of Strauss, Strauss, Louis Strauss. Um, but he was one of the first AEC commissioners. And this is the guy who kind of, he's the villain in the movie Oppenheimer, right? He's the one downing place. This is Kitty Oppenheimer. This is what she actually looked like. Uh, this is uh, Robert Oppenheimer's wife. She was a biologist. She was also a Communist Party member in the 1930s and introduced Oppenheimer to a lot of these left-wing uh, characters. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was actually her third husband. Uh, so in the movie, maybe one of the greatest greatest casting ever made. I, I can imagine Christopher Nolan, you know, telling Killian Murphy, "You got the role just as long as you actually become Oppenheimer." And and, and him doing it. So Killian Murphy as J. Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think Emily Blunt looks that much like, uh, <laughs> like Kitty Oppenheimer. Not to make fun of Kitty Oppenheimer, but Emily Blunt is, you know, amazingly beautiful. Um, Robert Downey Jr., they really made him up to look a lot like Louis Strauss, right? I mean, it, this is not this is not a comparable picture because in the movie, he looks he looks a lot like Strauss, I, I think. Um, this is the guy that had playing Robbie. This is the guy that had playing Teller. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of Matthew Modine. I, I saw him in the movie... And it's like, oh, you know, there's Bobby Modi. Who's he playing? I didn't. I never realized he was playing Vannevar Bush. I mean, they both have us kind of wrong face. May, and that is probably one of the bad things about the movie. One of the criticisms is it throws a lot of characters at you because there were a lot of characters. 
but it throws a lot of characters and it doesn't necessarily uh, identify everybody. This is Fermi. This is the hairy guy that got to play Fermi. Fermi was always bald. I think it's insulting that they got a guy with hair to play Fermi. Uh, this, uh, we already looked at Leslie Crows, but there's, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 yeah, what, what's his boyfriend's name? Uh, Ben Ab, yeah, Ben Ab's like boyfriend, yeah. Um, but again, I think he looked a lot, once you've had the mustache on, he looked all, a lot like Rose, right? Uh, I think this was the best casting. Tom Conti as as Einstein, and this is a picture of Einstein on a, a, a sailboat, and damn, he doesn't look just like Tom Conti. I think that was a fantastic casting. Um, honorable mention, Josh Hart actually looked a whole lot like Marx, too, I thought. And, and, um, looking for where that is. Bad casting. Kenneth Branagh doesn't look a damn thing like Niels Bohr. Um, so <laughs> Niels Bohr was tall too. He's big, well, he's big Dane, you know, big Viking looking guys. This is this is Niels Bohr with Oppenheimer, but more importantly, this is Niels Bohr with Louis Armstrong. <laughs> you don't get cooler than that. All right, Louis, Louis is my man, and uh, being a Louisianian. Uh, this honorable mention Jack Quaid. If you mentioned Jack, if you remember Jack Quaid from uh, the Boys, uh, he's Huey and the Boys. He's also the, one of the voices from Star Trek Lawyer of Nick. He always plays a really nervous character. You know, it's just, oh my God, everything's going to happen. And that's not what Richard Feynman was like at all. Feynman was also a cool dude. But, uh, um, you know, it is, it, is, it is what it is. Back to the Manhattan Project. Okay, by the mid 1940s, they come up with one of the bomb designs, which was called a gun design. And it became the basis of what was known as Little Boy. That's the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It was based on the fissile nucleus uranium-235, isotopeless uranium. Uh, and the designers were fairly confident that it would work, okay? But they still did, did what were called criticality tests. Add a little bit more uranium, a little bit more uranium, see how much radioactivity it's giving off. Uh, they call it tinkling the dragon's tail. Uh, she'll talk more about that in two weeks. Um, but the gun type couldn't work with plutonium. Uh, they wanted plutonium 239. There was too much 240 in it that contaminated it. 240 spontaneously began fission. So they had to come up with a different design. That was called the Christie Gadget after Robert Christie, one of Oppenheimer's students. This eventually became the Fat Man bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. But they weren't sure of this. This is the implosion bomb uh, compared to the gun type bomb. They weren't sure it was work, work, would work, and so they needed to test it. That's why you had a Trinity test in the first place. As a demonstration of the bomb and also to actually prove that the plutonium implosion design would work. So that's why we have Trinity. So where is Trinity? Trinity was here at the White Sands uh, missile range. Trinity, world's first explosion. This Roswell, Mexico is over here. Uh, Albuquerque is here. Santa Fe is here. Los Alamos is here. Here, uh, Bandolero uh, National Park. It is a stunningly gorgeous area up there uh deep ravines that was part of picking that site if if everything went completely sideways we could just dump it down in the ravine right it was, was part of the idea um so uh but they had to transport the bomb the plutonium bomb remember to test it all the way down from here to here i've done that drive it's about three hours now um but um, that's where the explosion occurred this is a scene from the movie. This is supposed to be Leslie Groves again. This is supposed to be Frank Oppenheimer, uh, who was uh, Robert Heimer's brother, Robert Oppenheimer's brother, and also a physicist. Uh, this is from the trip I took in 2004 to the Trinity site. That's all that remains of, of the test stand is the little stub of uh, of the tower, and, and uh, which is pretty. Everything else was vaporized. Uh, this is an obelisk that was place there later as a memorial. It's a National Historic Site. This is this is what's called Trinitite. This is glassy rock that was created by the heat and pressure of the atomic explosion. And there's it's still hot uh, because of a bunch of physicists. A lot of people in, the, in 2004 had Geiger counters with them. They're going around. Oh, that's really hot right there. Ooh. Yeah, because physicists, right? It was awesome. They open it up to the public the first weekend in April and the first weekend in October. That's the only time you can visit. But we had a special visit, so they were able, we were the only visitors there that day. Uh, Simplify, folks. What happened at Trinity? Okay, this is also pictures from the trip. 
the final bomb assembly happened. This, this, to me, this is one of the most awesome stories of the whole project. It's not told in the movie. Final assembly was in a dirty, dusty ranch house with one damn bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling. <clears throat> um, this guy right here, Philip Morrison, who was crippled by polio, drove that thing from Los Alamos to Alamogordo in the back of a 1939 Dodge sedan. <laughs> now that's American. These these were giants. They, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> Herbert Lair, who actually doesn't have a Wikipedia article, by the way. Herbert Lair, uh, this is him carrying the plutonium core. Um, he was uh, in the Army. Uh, 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 he uh, was an engineer from New York. Uh, he was a part of the Army Detachment of Los Alamos. He had carried the plutonium core. He and uh, Harry uh, uh, Daglin loaded up into the sedan, and then Philip Morris, who, again, couldn't walk without crutches, drives it down there to all of Florida. Uh, Herb Blair died last year. Uh, he was 95 years old. Um, uh, Daglin died a lot earlier. At least Dr. Fowler would talk about him as well. And he'll tell you what happened to him. Um, the gadget was assembled here in the ranch house, about two miles away from the tower. But then it started raining. What was called what they call the monsoon out in New Mexico. Every now and then it rains in the desert, and they had torrential rains for a couple of days. They didn't want to put it up on the tower because they afraid lightning would strike and set it off, which would suck. And so. <laughs> they waited, and finally, early in the morning, July 16th, they were able to get it up in a tower and mount it, so, and, and detonate it about 5.30 that morning. Um, this is actual, this is the Trinity explosion. This is not Nolan's recreation, okay? Um, a, a still photograph. They had a lot of cameras set up, a lot of Geiger counters, a lot of uh, measurement devices. Um, it yielded about 25 kilotons equivalent. Uh, in TNT, about 25 kiloton explosion. Robbie had guessed closest. He guessed it would be about 18 kilotons. Fermi actually measured, tried to measure the yield by letting go of pieces of paper and seeing how far back they would travel because Fermi. Um, there was a mushroom crowd pile that was uh, seven and a half miles high. They heard it as far well away as El Paso. Uh, there was a cover story created to say that a munitions dump had gone off. Uh, and they released that to the press, but then after Hiroshima, they said what had actually happened. It had to be on the 16th because the Potsdam Conference in Potsdam, Germany was starting. And that's where Churchill and Roosevelt, no, Churchill and Truman, Roosevelt was dead by then. Roosevelt had died in April. Roosevelt, uh, Truman, and Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, decided who would get what, essentially, how post-war Europe would be carved up. Uh, and Truman wanted to, and also what would happen with the Japanese? Would the Soviets enter the war against the Japanese? Uh, would would they allow the Japanese to sue, sue for peace without totally surrendering? Things like that. Um, and so they sent a coded message uh, to the Secretary of War. We didn't have a Secretary of Defense back then. It was Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. Operated on this morning. Diagnose, diagnosis not yet complete, but results seem satisfactory and already exceed expectations. Local press release necessary as interest extends great distance. Dr. Groves, pleased he returns tomorrow. I will keep you posted. And so Truman told Stalin that we had a bomb, you know, without saying it was an atomic bomb. We had this bomb of great, Stalin already knew. Soviets already had spies at Los Alamos, including a physicist by the name of Klaus Fuchs, uh, who had come over as part of the British detachment. Um, and as, as well as Green Glass and some of the other Rosenbergs who weren't at Los Alamos, but uh, were part of it. All right, a couple of things on the science. Uh, uh, this actually went longer than I thought it was going to. Was Oppenheimer a great scientist? Well, Oppenheimer did most of his important work in the 20s and 30s. He only published five papers after World War II, and one, one was like in biophysics. Uh, he made important contributions to astronomy and nuclear physics, uh, relativity. Uh, he predicted neutrons before Chadwick discovered it, mesons, neutron stars. Uh, probably his most important work was what's called the Born-Oppenheimer uh, Approximation, named after Max Born, who had been his dissertation advisor. Max Born 
was Olivia Newton-John's grandfather. He, when he left Germany to escape the Nazis, they actually went to India first, to Bangalore, and then they went to Britain. His, his daughter married uh, uh, a, a, a Newton-John, uh, a, a British uh, lieutenant, who was also the guy who arrested Rudolf Hess when Hess uh, escaped Germany. Didn't know anything about World War II history. Uh, but Max Warren, Olivia Newton-John's grandfather. Uh, the Oppenheimer Phillips process, this is deuteron-induced nuclei. Uh, deuteron is the, the nucleus of heavy water. He worked on this with his first graduate student at Berkeley, Melba Phillips, who later became an educator and, and a faculty member uh, back in New York. I mean. The tolman oppenheimer volkoff limit, that basically sets the upper mass on how heavy a neutron star can be. Um, Richard Tolman later was an advisor to Leslie Groves. I, it is possible that Tolman suggested Oppenheimer to Groves. We don't know exactly when Groves first approached Oppenheimer to be the science director. We do know, however, that Oppenheimer had an affair with Ruth Tolman, Richard Tolman's wife, uh, both before and after Tolman died in 1948. In fact, the movie makes it out that their affair is what called Richard calls Richard Tolman to have a heart attack. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, one of the important things that Oppenheimer did, Oppenheimer and his uh, student Hartman Snyder, who, who died really young at uh, age 49, um, they predicted the formation of black holes. They wrote the first paper, this is it, on continued gravitational contraction, so a star that keeps sucking in on itself. And it was published the day Germany invaded Poland and World War II in Europe began. And that's shown in the movie. Uh, and so like, like people didn't really give a damn. <laughs> at that point, uh, it was the world. The whole world was at war. Uh, but uh, that's actually true. Uh, that's not just the address. Was Oppenheimer a communist? So after World War II, uh, Oppenheimer, uh, you know, has a position in, with the government, with the Atomic Energy Commission. He has a security clearance. But there's a lot of people who don't like him and don't trust him. And again, it's this era of what's called the Red Scare. And Joseph McCarthy is accusing, you know communists of being in everywhere. So he, he lost his security clearance. He was probably never a communist. He was politically naive. Uh, he claimed he didn't read newspapers until like the late 20s. What you kind of have to remember is calling somebody a communist in 1932 is not the same as calling somebody a communist in 1952 or even in 2022. Uh, a lot of people who just like just wanted to feed the poor, thought corporations were too big. It's the middle of the Great Depression, after all. You know, sort of leaned left wing. Uh, tend to have those sort of affiliations. You know, they wanted to help out the Republicans fighting in the Spanish Civil War against the fascists and Franco, uh, which is shown in the movie. Oppenheimer sent money to, to the Spanish partisans, the uh, Republican partisans. It didn't necessarily mean that they sort of agreed with Marx and Lenin. And a lot of these... Folks on the left in the U.S. didn't realize the horrors, right? And so I'm not downplaying communism by any way. They didn't really know about the horrors that were going on in the Soviet Union until after Stalin died in uh, '53, I think. And uh, and Khrushchev kind of opened up and admitted to the gulags and a lot of the things that happened during the 20s and 30s. And, and people like Pete Seeger then renounced his membership in the Communist Party and, and, and things like that. So. You know, you have to have to keep the context in mind. That said, his wife was a communist. His brother Frank was a communist. He had close friends. The Chevaliers, who are shown in the movie, uh, were communists, and in fact, working with the Soviets and trying to channel information. I said, yeah. Philip Morris, the guy who had polio, he was a communist party member. They'd all been party members, so he had that association. And it was really easy to, you know, throw up. Uh, suspicion. And so he lost his security clearance and his political influence in 1954. But, you know, he still had a job. He still had a job at IAS. They bought a big house on the beach in St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands. My brother-in-law sent me a picture of it. The house actually isn't there, but you can visit the beach. Uh, they turned the house into a, a community center. On the other hand, his brother Frank lost his job and also lost his passport. He couldn't leave the U.S. He was penniless. They had to sell some of the art he had, he had inherited from his parents to survive. He eventually got a job, though, uh, uh, at the university, as a high school teacher, then at the University of Chicago. He became a physics education guy. He invented the Exploratorium, 
in San Francisco. Let me finish this up real quick. Was Oppenheimer a good person or a bad person? Was he a great person? Was he an evil person? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's all of the above. It's all of those. Uh, he uh, he sucked in a lot of ways as a human being, right? He had all these affairs. Uh, he had what was, you know, he called a womanizer back then. Um, his daughter committed suicide in 1977, by the way, uh, um, after her second marriage at the end of the she left the house uh, uh, to the St. John government. His son, Peter, is still alive. Uh, he was a carpenter. He lives out in New Mexico, uh, retired. He's in his 80s now. Um, in his public life, he never, he was always ambiguous about the bomb and the moral ramifications of the bomb. Um, after Germany's defeat, you know, it was more of an intellectual exercise to him, I think. Uh, he was con uh, opposed to the construction of the hydrogen bomb. And that isolated him further. Right? This is the famous quote. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and watch, watch this. But everybody, everybody has heard about this. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. He said, I guess it worked. Um, but I mean, he again was a very well read, he didn't learn Sanskrit and, and read it. You know, um, it's not to say he didn't think that, but by all reports, what he said with Bob went off was, I guess it worked. Um, conclusion hey, what, if you haven't seen the movie, see the movie. The movie's worth seeing. It's, it's really good. Could have been a little shorter. Um, it's generally pretty accurate. There's one terrible thing, Lawrence, in the movie, Lawrence says he's building a cyclotron to accelerate electrons. It was really to accelerate protons. I was the only one in the theater who laughed. Um, <laughs> and Nolan does, he has all these scenes with all these like lights and little dots and things swirling around. And we came out of the theater, my wife told me, he said, is that how physicists think? Is that what you see in your head when you're thinking about physics? Well, yeah, all the time. Uh, so, and one other cool thing: any other director, I think, would would have made the present right. So, like the 1950s with all the hearings with the security clearance, they would they would have made that in color because that's now, right? And would have, they would have made the flashbacks black and white. No one did just the opposite. And so, all the security clearance and hearings, all that stuff, is in black and white. Maybe because it was that sort of you know, you're either for us or against us. And all the flashbacks in the early life of Manhattan Project and stuff is color. It's five o'clock. Let me finish this off. Um, read all you can about the rise of communism and fascism in the 20th century. Read all you can about World War II. It's it's still pertinent. Uh, amazingly so. It still reverberates down today. So, um, just a uh, last slide. I thought, hey, look, I think Barbenheimer was great. I think it was a great idea. I am all for that. I think that's how we should always do it. We should have like a, a cool, fun movie and a serious movie. I think when they release Killer Killer of the Flower Moon, they ought to have some like fun movie that goes with it. You go see both of them at the same time, right? Did you buy part of the movie? Movie? I didn't actually. I should have. Look, Geneva, it's, uh, it's expensive enough just to watch one movie. I ain't going to spend $100 to watch two, okay? So uh, today was all about Oppenheimer's, the science, the history of the movie. Next week is Monster Mash, so we won't have a science seminar. Y'all are going to be out doing the demos with the kids. Uh, but then November 2nd, Dr. Faddle will talk about the Demon Core and playing with criticality. And on November 9th, Dr. Semichevic will teach you how to build an atomic bomb using 1940s technology. All right? So uh, that's it. That's all I got. So.